Well, good evening. Welcome to Sunday evening service. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, Omri will shortly be beginning a series through Zephaniah. Uh, He is out this week, so that will begin next week. And this evening, what I'd like to do is turn to what is perhaps a familiar passage. uh, And I hope that it upends us once again. Have you read the news lately? There is economic uncertainty out there. Political turmoil, cultural upheaval. Our world is polarized in its various views of things. We are now facing, once again, the threat of nuclear conflict and World War III. I feel like I'm reliving my childhood this week in the news. There is instability and uncertainty and What God's people need more than anything is to renew a vision of the King, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the universe, high and lifted up. We're going to take a trip backwards in time this evening, some 700 years before Christ, to see the prophet Isaiah in his commissioning to prophetic ministry. He has an encounter with the Holy One of Israel. This was Isaiah's favorite title for God. It occurs 29 times in the book of Isaiah and only six times outside. Isaiah's use of this title for God gives us some insight into what made him as a man, what made him who he was, what made him the prophet that he was. I want you to imagine God's invitation to Isaiah to a job, to a task, to a prophetic office. Imagine hearing this from from God. I want you, Isaiah, to take my message to my people. They have rejected me. And I have turned them over to their hardness of heart. They will be attacked. They will be taken captive. And you will not see them repent. Hearing, they will not hear. Seeing, they will not see. But I want you to speak to them anyway, because I will use true and gracious words to harden their hearts so that they will not believe. Now, go speak to them. No one will listen. Isaiah would live through four administrations. He would live under siege by one world superpower. He would live under captivity of another. He would see the rejection of the people. And he would watch his own countrymen plunged into the consequences of their own sin. Would you sign up for that job? If you've read the book of Isaiah, you know that it's not all hopeless. (laughs) There is, in fact, much promise, much hope. There is the message of God's salvation in this book. Isaiah himself would see a remnant preserved. And he would see the future hope of Israel introduced in striking fashion. But what would sustain a man through such a difficult job description? I believe the fuel that drove Isaiah's life and ministry comes from his initial call to that prophetic office. And we'll spend our evening this evening looking at Isaiah's call to ministry because it defined him. And my prayer is that we will not do so disinterested, sort of disembodied from this text. I want you to put yourself, if you can, in Isaiah's shoes. Imagine what would it be like to experience what he experienced. Let's read together Isaiah chapter 6 and the first seven verses. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the hem of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And the one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me. For I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. He touched my mouth with it. And he said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Isaiah's introduction to prophetic ministry was his encounter with the holiness of God. We're going to look at that encounter this evening in four parts. First, we'll look at Israel's situation. We see this in verse 1. Look there with me. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. The year that King Uzziah died was significant in the history of Israel. Notice he does not say in the beginning of Jotham's reign. He doesn't list this event by Uzziah's successor. The death of Uzziah was significant, both for Isaiah and for the people. And so Isaiah marks this significant event in his own life by the end of Uzziah's reign. This is approximately 740 BC and the end of a 52-year reign. Uzziah was a godly king. And the nation under his rule was marked by peace and by prosperity. Listen to 2 Chronicles 26. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did right in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the vision of God. And as long as he sought Yahweh, God prospered him. It was written of Uzziah that he built out the kingdom, that he won back lost territory. He built giant engines that shot darts and flung large boulders in defense of his territory. He built siege works uh, to take over other fortifications. He expanded the nation's borders, built up the defenses. He filled homes with foods and goods. Under Uzziah's reign, there was a chicken dinner on every table and a car in every garage. That's an anachronism. God blessed the southern kingdom while Uzziah was king. Despite the nation's moral and spiritual decline, Israel at this time was in fact marked by apostasy and idolatry. Flip back a few pages in Isaiah to Isaiah chapter 1. The opening pages of God's indictment of the nation give us an indication of what the country was like. Verse 4, alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned Yahweh. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. The rhetorical question there is, what will it take for God to get your attention? Your heart is going the wrong direction, and and God keeps bringing trials into your life. It seems that Uzziah's personal devotion to God served as a check on the national apostasy. 2 Chronicles 26.16 reveals this about Uzziah. When he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly and he was unfaithful to Yahweh, his God. You see, Uzziah usurped the priestly role. Under the theocracy of Israel, there was a division of responsibilities. You could not be king and priest. Uzziah decided he would be priest as well. He offered incense in the temple. 81 priests devoted to Yahweh tried to stop him. He was furious at the priests, and he tried to offer incense anyway, and immediately leprosy broke out on his forehead. This was a judgment from God. He had crossed the line, and in his last decade of his life, he lived in his house alone, quarantined, unclean. Wherever the king would go, the crowds had to clear and people would call out, unclean, unclean, unclean. He lived in isolation and shame. So his son, Jotham, effectively ran the nation in his place for the last 10 years of his life. When Uzziah died, the national glory of Israel died with him and has never yet been recovered. Five years before Uzziah's death, Tiglath-Pileser III, 
took the reins of the burgeoning Assyrian Empire, the rising new world power. His goal was to conquer the world. The people of the land of Israel were unsettled. They had heard the news. The long, stable reign of a good king was at its end. A rising superpower had emerged on the horizon to threaten their way of life, and no one knew what the next administration would bring. Uzziah's death promoted panic among the people, and his own spiritual degradation was an outward emblem of the inward spiritual apostasy of the whole nation. In one sense, the long godly reign of this king had checked the consequences of Israel's decline. The nation was blessed while Uzziah was faithful to God. Now the king is dead. And what will happen? And that's Israel's situation. We see next in Isaiah 6, God's revelation. God is going to reveal himself to the prophet. What better thing for Isaiah to see than the unvarnished presence of the glory of God. What shaped Isaiah for the entirety of his life, this glimpse of the transcendent greatness of God. Look at verse 1. In the king of Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, and the hem of his robe filling the temple. Notice who Isaiah saw the Lord And this is not the all capital letters Lord. This is the Hebrew word Adonai. It means master, the one who is in charge of everything, the one who is sovereign. So in the year the king died, I saw the king, high, exalted. He was seated on a throne. Here the curtains of heaven are drawn back and we get a behind the scenes look at the events of the universe. What is really going on in the world? God is on his throne. He is making all things happen according to his plan, regardless of what it seems like to us on this earth, regardless of what men think, God is sovereign and he is accomplishing all things according to his purpose. Isaiah records he is lofty and exalted. That is, he is transcendent. He's bigger than the imagination can take in. He is great and high. His glory and majesty is of someone too big to comprehend. Isaiah tells us the train of his robe filled the temple. Kingly garments are symbols of their greatness. The garb, the clothing of ancient kings reflected their greatness and power. And here the word train might better be understood as hem. That is, the temple was filled with the mere edge of this king's robe. And what is this temple? Is this the earthly temple or the heavenly temple? We're not told. It seems to me this is probably the heavenly temple after which the earthly temple is patterned. What do we see here? Transcendence. God is beyond everything and imminence. That is, God is also present. He's near. He's right up close. Isaiah has a front row view to God himself. His manifest presence is filling the temple. And there's no room for anyone to stand. As far as Isaiah could see, the edge of this king's garment fills up all the space. And this is curious. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. What does he mean by I saw the Lord? Exodus 33, 20 says, no man may see me and live. 1 Timothy 6, 16 tells us that God dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen nor can see. And John 1, 18 tells us no one has seen God at any time. What does it mean when Isaiah says, I saw Adonai? Well, certainly Isaiah did not see God in his fullness. How could a finite creature take in the infinite immensity of immortal God? Notice what he describes here. You're waiting for a description of of some corporeal being, some some body, some, some physical features that could be pointed to. Nothing of the sort is described. Isaiah describes a throne. He portrays a sense of immensity. There is a robe and a temple. He will see creatures and smoke and an altar. This is God manifesting his presence. 
Notice verse 2. Seraphim stood. What are seraphim? In, in Hebrew, the plural ending, like our English S on the end of the word, the, the em ending is your plural ending. So one seraph, two seraphim. Here we have a, a plurality of seraphim. There's no physical description of Edonai here, but there is a detailed physical description of these seraphim. The word seraphim probably means something like fiery ones. This is the only place in the Bible where the word seraphim is used and perhaps the only place where they are described unless in Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4, the four living creatures in Revelation 5 and following are these same creatures. I I believe that they are. Here's the only place they are called seraphim and they are described as having six wings each. They have wings to fly. In other words, there's no room to stand on the ground. The hem of the king's robe is is filling up the entirety of the place. And they have wings with which they cover their faces. You see, these fiery ones cannot seem to stand the blazing glory of the unshield presence of God. And they have wings with which they cover their feet. The text tells us they stand flying. It means there's something like hovering. Perhaps it's important for them to demonstrate that while they are hovering above the hem of the robe spatially, they are not above God in rank. And even as Moses had to remove his shoes when he was on holy ground before the Lord, so these creatures must guard their feet from dishonoring the glory of God. What made the ground holy? The presence of the Holy One of Israel. God fits creatures for their environments. Fish have gills and fins. Birds have light bones and feathers. And as R.C. Sproul has pointed out, these seraphim are designed for their habitat. And their environment is the unvarnished glory of God. And if you or I were to come into the presence of one of these creatures, no doubt we would fall in amazement. In abject terror, I believe we would be tempted to worship these creatures. John the Apostle falls down in front of an angel in the book of Revelation, and the angel has to say to John, I am your fellow slave. Get up. Don't do that. Worship God. But these creatures are so magnificent, amazing, even terrifying. We would be tempted to worship them. What's remarkable here is what these creatures are doing. Notice verse 3. One called out to another and they said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This idea of one calling out to another. One seraph is calling out to another seraph. Holy, holy, holy. And the other seraph is echoing back to the other seraph. Holy, holy, holy. And they are crying out this antiphonal praise over and over and over again. Shielding their faces. Shielding their feet. Calling out praises to God. Calling out one to another. Holy, holy, holy. And here the divine name is used. Yahweh of hosts. Or Yahweh of armies. That is what that word hosts means. And this holiness that is described here is a fundamental attribute of God. And it is stated three times. He is holy, holy, holy. Three times holy. This repetition is a Hebrew literary device for emphasis. 2 Samuel 18.33 uses the same literary device when David is grieving over his degenerate son Absalom's death. My son Absalom, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, David cries out. Three times it is a superlative, emphatic. Sometimes two words are used back to back. In 2 Kings 25.15, we have a description of fine gold in English. But in Hebrew, it's just the word gold repeated. It is gold gold. It's a way to say it is the best gold. It is the Hebrew superlative, the the goldiest gold. I think Jesus is using this same sort of phrase when he says, truly, truly, I say to you. But the only attribute given in scripture of God with this threefold designation is holiness. God is said to be holy, holy, holy. 
We don't find a kindness, kindness, kindness refrain or a wrath, wrath, wrath refrain or a love, love, love refrain. But we do have this holy, 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 super superlative. What is on display in this chapter and what is seen as this vision, what is proclaimed by these creatures over and over again. In fact, what I believe these creatures surrounding the throne are still crying out. Revelation 4, 8 with the four living creatures with the six wings. Day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. They are still crying out this antiphonal praise. And what defined Isaiah's life and his ministry and what ought to define every one of us in this room is the abject holiness of God. We ought to be gripped by it. We ought to be refined by it, changed by it, stabilized by it, and destabilized by it. What is holiness? Holiness, simply stated, is otherness, separateness. God's holiness is his differentness. He is unlike anyone or anything else that exists. For God to be holy is to state that God is fundamentally different than everything. This is the creator-creature distinction. God's holiness is not first about his moral purity or his sinlessness. Although he, of course, is totally separate from sin, But think about this, so are the seraphim. These fiery ones have never sinned, and they never will sin. They themselves are morally pure, and yet they shield their faces, and they shield their feet, and they hover over holy ground, and they cry out to one another in ceaseless praise, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh. That is, they are crying out, he is different, he is different. He is different than we. They recognize their fundamental difference from God. Again, if we saw them, we'd be tempted to worship them. Notice verse 4. The foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of the one calling out while the temple was filling with smoke. The temple shook at its foundations but not from the voice of God. And notice the the shaking of the foundations of the temple comes from the voices of the seraphim. Inanimate architectural structures have the sense to tremble in such a setting. These are awesome creatures recognizing their creaturehood before the creator. The temple filled with smoke. The smoke seems to be the result of the crying out of these fiery ones. We would be terrified in their presence, yet they are mere creatures. In fact, you and I are much more like these six-winged fiery beings than we are like God, in the sense that we are finite, we are created, and we are utterly dependent. And they are much more like us than they are like God, for they are creatures, and they are finite, and they are dependent. They are worshipers of God, just as we. Now, we are different than they because we are created in God's image and his likeness. But the holiness of God is fundamental to his godness. In fact, everything about God is holy. Every one of his attributes is holy. God's holiness is not at odds. It's not an enemy to his mercy. God's holiness is not an enemy of his grace. God's holiness is not at odds with his kindness or his gentleness. Every one of his attributes is holy. God's love is a holy love. God's wrath is not some out of control, childlike temper tantrum. God's wrath is a holy wrath. It is in keeping with his character. God's patience is a holy patience. God's omnipotence is a holy power. God's mercy is a holy mercy. Having a great big view of the transcendent glory of God makes you who you are. A.W. Tozer said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Your view of God shapes you. What did Isaiah think about when he saw God? What was his response? 
This brings us to the third portion of Isaiah's vision. It is Isaiah's own personal devastation. Coming into the presence of the holiness of God is fundamentally destabilizing for sinners. Look at verse 5. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. Isaiah's response is not a casual approach to a comfortable God. Then I said, what would you say? Isaiah does not waltz in, pepper God with a bunch of curiosity questions. Is a platypus a bird or a mammal? Hey, is the next administration going to be any better than this last one? He doesn't start singing. He doesn't give God a high five. He isn't chummy with God. He doesn't give a trite, I love you. Isaiah is not comfortable in God's presence. He is devastated in God's presence. He cries out, woe, woe to me. He is calling curses from heaven down upon himself. It is as if Isaiah here is saying, damnation upon me. This is like the woes laid out in Isaiah chapter 5. Turn a page to the left. In Isaiah 5, Isaiah the prophet is leveling heaven's woes or judgments against the nation. Woe to those, verse 8, who add house to house and join field to field until there's no more room so that you have to live alone in the midst of the land. Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may pursue strong drink, who stay up late in the evening that wine may inflame them. Verse 18, woe to those who drag iniquity with the cords of falsehood and sin as with cart ropes. Who say, let him make speed, let him hasten his work that we may see it. Let the purpose of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come to pass that we may know it. They just drag their sin around, making plans and provisions for it. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, clever in their own sight. Verse 22, woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of those who are in the right. All of these woes Isaiah was familiar with in verse 5 as heaven's appropriate, right, just condemnations of the sinful activities of the people. And then Isaiah, perhaps the holiest guy in the nation, comes into the presence of a holy God. And what does he say? Damnation upon me. Woe is me. Isaiah is devastated here. Why? For I am ruined, he says, undone, disintegrated, finished. I've come all apart. Why is Isaiah devastated? Because he was a sinner. I, the first person pronoun is repeated here in this verse. He says, I, I myself am a man of unclean lips. And the juxtaposition of his own sin with the manifest holiness of God made for a devastating psychological experience that we as humans would try at all costs to avoid. Listen, we try to limit our exposure. Naturally speaking, the exposure of ourselves and our exposure to God. We want distractions from the glorious holiness of God. We numb our consciences. We rewrite good and evil. We distract ourselves. Medication, recreation. Maybe we pat each other on the back and we say, oh, you're not that bad. You know, nobody's perfect. Isaiah was the best guy in the nation. And he's undone in the presence of God. And so Isaiah could do no such thing. He cannot comfort himself with his own achievements. 
He cannot comfort himself with some empty, vain thought that he was better than the next guy. No, he, the sinner, was brought into the immediate presence of God and all of his holiness. His self-esteem went out the window. Isaiah was secure before this experience, and now he is totally undone. He had it together before this vision, and now it has all come apart. Everything changed for Isaiah because for the first time, he saw God. And in a very real sense, of others, as others have pointed out, for the first time, Isaiah saw himself. And the holiness of God compelled a confession of sin. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. Where does Isaiah's self-awareness go? This is really pointed. You see, the prophet's chief instrument was his mouth. Isaiah had grown up in diplomatic circles with family connections. He lived and grew up in the royal household. His writings are the pinnacle of the literary genius in the Old Testament. He was a master with words. Yet he is immediately aware that his very strength was fraught with terminal trouble. Out of the mouth, the heart speaks. The lips are the revealer of the inner man. And Isaiah, in the presence of God, was immediately aware of his own personal inner wretchedness. He was exposed, helpless. Not only were his own lips culpable, but his associations were tainted as well. He says, I live among a people of unclean lips. And one might be tempted to think that having a dirty mouth is a pretty small thing on the list of evils that could be done. But any sin in the presence of a holy God is deadly. Isaiah says, for my eyes have seen the King Yahweh of hosts. And Isaiah's response is the only appropriate response. Who precisely did Isaiah see? He says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw Edonai. Edonai, master or Lord. It's translated by the Greek word kurios in the New Testament. This is the word most often used of Jesus, the Lord. Philippians 2 tells us that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess that Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord. He is kurios. He is Edonai. But listen to John 12, 41. The Apostle John writes of this moment. In fact, he speaks of Isaiah's commission that God would send Isaiah to hard-hearted people who would not listen in verse 40. And then he says in verse 41, these things Isaiah said because Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. Who is the he and the him in John 12? John is talking about Jesus. Who did Isaiah see in Isaiah 6? None other than the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, before Bethlehem, before he took on permanent human flesh. John quotes Isaiah 6.10 and says that Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke of him. What does that mean? Isaiah was undone at the sight of Jesus, pre-incarnate, in all of his glory. This is not unlike Peter in Luke 5, 8, following a miracle where Peter said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Or the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 1, When I saw him, John writes, I fell at his feet like a dead man. How easily we overestimate ourselves. We tend to have a very large view of man, a large view of ourselves, and a small view of God. We underestimate sin. We think it is a trifle, no big deal, excusable. We underestimate the holiness of God. I believe that you and I have never yet estimated ourselves accurately, for we have never yet seen God uncloaked. The smallest sin in the presence of a holy God is absolutely lethal. 
but there is a gracious reconciliation. The fourth part of this scene, beginning in verse six. Then, it's just striking that the scene doesn't end here. One of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. Notice God's gracious provision for the prophet here in verse 6 and 7. Isaiah was helpless. He could bring nothing that could ameliorate God's wrath. He could not fix his fundamental problem. He could not change God's nature. And what happens next is astounding. A seraph flew to Isaiah. These seraphim are hovering around God, waiting on him to do his bidding And a seraph flies to the altar, takes a red hot coal and flies at Isaiah. What would you think? This fiery flying creature who's allowed to hover in God's blinding presence approaches you with a red hot coal. He's holding it with tongs. Why is this fiery being holding a a fiery coal with tongs? Is it too hot for him? Too holy for him? Isaiah must assume here that he's done for. That he's getting exactly what he deserves. That fiery creature is taking aim at my mouth, the very instrument of my sin. But notice where the seraph got the burning coal from. The altar. I believe this is the altar of sacrifice described in Leviticus 6. It's, It's the heavenly one after which the earthly one is patterned. And this altar in the earthly temple was the fire that was to be kept burning all the time, and animals were to be sacrificed on it every day. This was God's provision for forgiveness of sin for his people. The fire of the altar burnt the bodies of the animals sacrificed as substitutes for human sin. These animal sacrifices were a temporary provisional emblem of the sacrifice that Jesus himself would make some 700 years later. And a burning coal from that altar of sacrifice is placed on Isaiah's mouth to signify that his sins are covered. Look at verse 7. He touched my mouth with it and he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. And your sin is forgiven. Remember that Isaiah confessed that he had filthy lips. Isaiah confessed what he knew. And God addressed what Isaiah confessed. But God goes farther than the confession of Isaiah. He doesn't just say, I've taken care of your dirty words. Your unclean lips. He says, your iniquity is taken away. Isaiah is now declared to have no more iniquity. He's declared righteous on the basis of a sacrifice that has not yet been carried out, but has been accomplished from before time began. His sin is forgiven. And the Hebrew word used here is the word for cover in the sense of paid for, like I'll cover the tab for your meal. Isaiah's sins have been covered paid for by God's gracious provision. Isaiah saw Jesus, John 12, 41. Listen to Isaiah 52, verse 13. This is the first portion of that servant song, that magnificent explanation of the gospel of Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice written 700 years before Christ came. And listen to how this servant is described. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, Yahweh says, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Here in the same book, Isaiah 6 describes Adonai high and lifted up and exalted. The same vocabulary is used specifically about the suffering servant. Jesus would come, the one worthy of all worship, the one at whose name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is indeed Lord. He would come to suffer at the hands of sinful men, to bear the weight of the iniquity that was not his own, but the sins of his people. And he would be crushed 
by the glorious justice of his father against that sin. There's something remarkable here about God's dealings with sinful humanity. Isaiah has viewed the inner sanctum where the glory of God shines unabated, and there's an altar in there. And from this altar, the glory of God radiates forgiveness of sin. But there is another scene in Scripture where the curtains are pulled back and we get a behind-the-scenes look at that inner sanctum and the glory of God. It is in Revelation chapter 8, and it is the scene of the seventh seal judgment. And in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 8, we see an angel take a censer and fill it with fire from that altar and throw it onto the earth. And the result of that fire from the altar thrown onto the earth is the unfolding of seven trumpet judgments. These are God's outpouring of wrath against the earth dwellers, the unrepentant ones on the earth. It is coal from that altar that destroys sinful humanity. But it is coal from that altar that forgives repentant sinners. What a remarkable dichotomy. It is the glory of God both to judge and to forgive. Both of these things come out of God's holiness. His transcendent greatness, his glory. God is holy. Any creature that would survive in his uncloaked presence must be purified, set apart, forgiven, declared righteous, and then ultimately made righteous. When we think about Isaiah's commission, that job description, it's a tough task. Go tell the people. And tell them this. Listen, but don't hear. How long will I tell them this? And God says, until they are desolate. The gracious words of God given to the people of Israel would in fact be a judgment of God where those gracious words would harden recalcitrant hearts. But God promises a remnant will remain. Verse 13 of chapter 6, yet there will be a tenth portion in it. The holy seed is a stump like the leftover of a cutoff tree. It will grow according to God's grace. Isaiah's commission was unique, but it has bearing on each of us. You see, one who has encountered God's holiness and has been forgiven has something to say to the world. And as you run your race and as you live out your commission, you may find that your words fall on deaf ears. It is God's glory to judge and to harden hearts. It is God's glory to soften hearts and to save. He is king. He is Yahweh of armies. We are his slaves. Our task is to proclaim good news indiscriminately everywhere we go. We may find ourselves to be in a season where people hear the gospel and believe. And we may find ourselves in a season where people will not hear and will not believe. Our task is the same. What fuels faithfulness for us as believers in an uncertain world? A renewed vision of the glory of God, a renewed vision of the King, the Holy One of Israel, high and lifted up. If you were to see him in unvarnished glory and walk out of that place alive and with a commission, you'd keep it. Jude 24 tells us that the one that Isaiah saw is able to make us stand in his presence blameless and with great joy. There's a day coming, Christian, when not only will you be forgiven of your sin, but you will have removed from you the possibility of sin whatsoever. If any man can tame the tongue, he's a perfect man. Inside and out, you will be unable to sin. 
and as far as it's possible for finite human beings to resemble the infinite glory of the second person of the Trinity, you will look like Jesus. And you will be able to stand in his presence blameless with great joy, not falling down as a dead man, not saying, woe is me, but singing, rejoicing, doing all that, has, that God has in store for us in eternity. What stabilizes God's people in times of turmoil and uncertainty? I believe a renewed view of the transcendent greatness of God. What fuels missionary endeavor when the outcome is uncertain? It seems that none may listen. Whether your missionary endeavor is in your own home with a captive audience of rugrats, or whether your missionary endeavor is in a far off place with difficult people. A renewed view of the transcendent greatness of God fuels the mission. Listen, friends, the Holy One of Israel is still on his throne. He will have his way. He will have his day. How good is it to be forgiven and to know him? Let's pray. O oh Lord, Adonai, Yahweh of armies, you are holy, holy, holy. You are different. You are morally pure and you are fundamentally, infinitely strange compared to us. We are creatures and we are totally dependent on you. What an awesome thing it is to catch a glimpse of you like this in your word. May we not be unchanged. May we not be unmoved. May we walk from this room eager to fulfill the commission that you have given to your servants, your slaves on this earth, to be proclaimers of good news, to be heralds of your saving grace and your soon return. We pray that you would sustain us in times of tumult, to be faithful to that task for your glory in Jesus name. Amen.